ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القران المجيد بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد i would like to tell you a story about a boy and a girl their adolescence with raging hormones and they begin dating they spend all of their free time together either talking on the phone or texting or physically going out and of course going out costs money so the boy has a part-time job and whatever he makes he spends on her taking her out to dinners and movies getting her clever personalized gifts chocolates and flowers romantic stuff unfortunately the part-time job plus shopping for her plus coming up with elaborate surprises taking her out talking on the phone and texting and just plain thinking about her all the time has taken up so much of his time and mental capacity that as you can imagine his grades begin to slip after several years they're now getting older and she's thinking about her future she no longer places so much importance on movies and flowers and chocolates she's realizing that what really matters in a man is his ability to provide why because she's thinking about her future she's thinking about family she's thinking about pregnancy and she knows that pregnancy makes a woman very dependent very vulnerable and she'll need a very strong supporter she's now acting less and less interested in this guy so what does he do he does what he knows best he tries harder and harder to be romantic and he can't figure out why it's just not working finally she breaks it off with him and she explains i was just a girl and you were just a boy we were in love and we had so much fun together but now i'm a woman and i'm looking for a man and you should have been developing yourself into a man for these past 2 3 4 5 however many years they've been together but you were too busy chasing me around all of your friends you know those guys who chose the library instead of chasing me they're now becoming engineers lawyers and doctors they'll be able to provide a home a car health insurance and all the things necessary for a family even if you try to catch up to them now you will be so far behind firstly and secondly there's no guarantee that you'll succeed we don't know versus them they have a track record of success they have been continuously proving that they can pass exams get degrees so on and so forth so now the boy as you can imagine and i call him a boy because he didn't grow up into a man he's still just a boy he's very depressed he lost the girl he lost those critical years that are used to determine who you're going to be in life those years are now gone he lost lots of money and even the memories that he made that he once considered so sweet are now tainted and bitter The only thing he has is a broken heart. And he wants to blame her. He wants to be angry at her and blame her for this. But the more he the more he thinks about it, the more he realizes that she didn't plot 
some elaborate scheme to sabotage his life. Rather, she just grew up. She just grew up. And the only person to blame is himself for not growing up sooner. So the topic that I'd like to discuss today is the topic of dating. I'm pretty sure everybody after listening to that feels like they just got a little punch to the gut, feels a little bit winded. Imagine how it feels to be that guy. You just listen to this story for a few minutes. Imagine the person himself, so broken, so frustrated, knowing what he lost. Now, the story that I described isn't everybody's story, but I've personally seen it play out enough times, time and time again, that honestly, when some young person comes to me and says, defiantly asking and questioning, why does Islam make dating haram? Why is Islam so tough on these things? Honestly, I can't help but chuckle. I can't help but laugh a little bit and say, look, I can't control you. I can't stop you from doing whatever you want to do. But just know this. There's a very good chance that in a few years from now, you'll come back to me and say, you know what? Now I get it. Because with a little bit of experience, when you've seen this play out time and time again, you realize and understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen is the way it is. A simple way of explaining it is this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to us an Islam, a religion, a deen that is wise, that is full of wisdom. And what is wisdom? How do you define wisdom? Wisdom is putting the right thing in the right place at the right time in the right amount, in the right way. So, if you are mature and if you have something to offer, then any young man, and if you have the courage, any young man has the right to approach any family and mention his interest in their daughter. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you lack the courage, if you lack the maturity, and if you feel you have nothing to offer, then going around and getting involved with this sister and that sister is truly the antithesis of wisdom. It is putting the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time because you do not possess the wisdom or the courage and you have nothing to offer. So you're simply not ready. Maybe it would be smarter if you focused on developing yourself. Just like in the story, those friends who realize that now's not the time, I need to make something out of myself first before I get involved. Just like that person, you need to recognize and realize that now is the time for self-development so that you can become someone who is reliable, so that you can become that which is deserving, a person who is deserving for marriage. Because marriage and relationships are no joke. They're no joke. It's not just two people having a good time together. It's a commitment. It's a contract. And it's something that becomes a bond and the basis for which to bring new people into this world. What could be more serious than that? What could be more of a responsibility than that? Than bringing a human being into this life. So clearly it's a very serious thing. And it should be a decision that is made with a very clear mind. You should be able to assess the individual from a logical perspective and not from an emotional one. And so, if you are engaged with talking and flirting and dating or even being intimate with someone and now you want to consider them for marriage, then in my opinion, and I believe in anybody who has any sort of rationality, you'll agree, that you are not approaching this situation with a clear head. Rather, your judgment is askew. You are approaching this from a very emotional basis, and this is unfortunately perhaps way too common and way too normal. That people consider marriage not from a position of rationality, but from a position of emotionality, saying, I can overlook this problem and that problem. Why? Because I'm just so attracted, or because we have so much fun together, or because they're so whatever the case may be. Not things that are important and serious. So my advice to any young people, any young men that perhaps are involved in these type of relationships, my advice is get serious or walk away. Make a decision. Get serious or walk away. And perhaps I can offer some words of advice that might help with regards to getting serious. Most young men feel very intimidated about the idea, the prospect of actually approaching a father because they feel like I'm going to be putting myself under such scrutiny. He's going to be judging me and evaluating me in such a heavy way. I don't know if I can handle it. Well, let me give you an idea that perhaps might help. 
instead of just thinking of it as him evaluating you, turn, turn the tables a little bit. Think about you evaluating the evaluator. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that you need to understand this man as well. He doesn't, he's not the only one that has to understand you, you have to understand him. Why? Because this is the father of the girl that you are interested in. And what that means is that for 20 something years of her life, however old she is, her definition of a man is this person. Whether she likes it or, or not, whether she uh, you know, acknowledges it or not, the fact of the matter is, every single day she has been looking to this man and he has been defining what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a father, etc. It is hardwired into her. And so because of that fact, if you are compatible with this man, and a way to understand compatibility is, simply put, if he was as young as you, or if you were as old as him, would you two be friends? Would you two have compatible lifestyles, similar views and values and ethics and so forth? If the answer is yes, then that is a good sign. There is no guarantees in life, by the way. There's no guarantees about marriage. But it is a good sign that inshallah ta'ala, the relationship will work. Why? Let's say, for example, if you realize that he's the type of guy that spends a certain, time, certain amount of time in the masjid, and you do too. He's this concerned about health, and so are you. He exercises and eats this type of way, and so do you. He's a workaholic, and he spends late nights working very hard to get ahead and you have that same workaholic attitude. Well, guess what? Then when you guys get married, inshallah ta'ala, and you are out late, and you text her saying, I gotta stay late, she'll say, oh, that's normal. That's exactly, that's what a man does. That's what a, that's what a man is supposed to be. However, if he's the type of man who works, comes home, sits on the couch, eats junk food, sits with his family, and just watches movies and television all day, then the moment you try to go to the gym, you go to the masjid, or you stay, spend extra time at work trying to get ahead, she'll say, why aren't we spending time together? Why are you ignoring me? She won't say, you're not acting like my father. No, it won't, it won't uh, occur in such clear language. It'll just be a feeling that something is wrong. And that feeling is rooted in what? The fact that you and the father were not compatible. So again, my advice to those young men who feel intimidated, don't feel like he's evaluating you, rather, I mean, that's true, of course, but at the same time, in addition to that, you should be, inshallah ta'ala, evaluating him. And I'll continue this same topic, inshallah, in the second khutbah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasmeen kathira. Bismillah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa mawala, amma ba'd. I remember several years ago bumping into a friend of mine, someone that I knew from high school. I, we hadn't seen each other for so many years. We bump into each other, and we actually spent a long time together. We talked about everything, because it's been so long and a lot, lot to catch up on. And as you can imagine, naturally, two guys hanging out, talking about all sorts of things. Eventually they start talking about relationships. And he starts going into detail about his dating life. And starts bragging about, you wouldn't believe, but I've been with, and he mentions a large number of women that he's been able to be with because of his lifestyle of going out and clubbing and every week a new girl, essentially. And it's nothing to be proud of, but the fact of the matter is, that as a man, when you hear this type of thing, the, let's say, instinctual reaction is to be impressed, to be attracted to that lifestyle. Wow, seriously? That number? That's, a, that's incredible. So at that moment, it felt like something inside of me was drawn to that lifestyle. It's not something I'm proud to admit, but I'm just trying to be relatable and tell the truth. There's something that was drawing me to that lifestyle, but at the same time, alhamdulillah, Iman is something that gets in the way and says, no, this is haram, this is evil, you're going to be accountable on judgment day, <laughs> Jahannam is real, and so your Iman steps in the way to, get, to, to prevent you from going down that road. But what was fascinating, what truly was remarkable to me, was that as the conversation went on, and he continued to describe the lifestyle that he was living, 
It wasn't Iman that was blocking the way. I just increasingly became less and less attracted and interested in this lifestyle at all. Let me explain. He started talking about, he works very hard, he tries to make a lot of money. Why? Because he has to spend a lot of money. When the weekend comes, you gotta go to the store, fancy stores, get the new designer clothes. Why? You wanna stand out, you wanna look good. Then it's off to the barber shop. Why? Because you gotta get fresh, new, you know, lined up and look good, look fancy. Then after that, before going to the club, you can't drive up in your car. You have to go and rent an even fancier car. Why? Because you gotta roll up looking like you're somebody very important. This is all part of the lifestyle. Then, of course, entering into the club, now you have to have banter, bar, bar banter as they say. You have to have very shallow and meaningless conversations one after the other. And on top of that, you have to spend a lot of money on extremely overpriced alcohol. And you have to be generous, you have to show that you can spend a lot. So, so much work throughout the week to make a great amount of money, all so that it can be poured into this process. And as I'm listening to this, and also, by the way, the type of relationships you have to have, all the friends that are not interested in that lifestyle, you slowly cut them out of your life, and you only develop friendships that, with people that are very interested and that will help you in this pursuit. Simply put, wingmen, other players, if you will. And so as he describes this, these very one-dimensional, shallow relationships, it was fascinating to me to feel a shift within myself. That before it was my Iman telling me this seems attractive, but you need to stay away from it. But at, slowly but surely, it wasn't the Iman in Allah and in the afterlife and in hellfire and so on and so forth. It wasn't that that was holding me back. I genuinely just felt bad for the guy. I genuinely felt like you're wasting your life. You're a smart person. You could have been getting a degree. You could have been making real friendships with some good guys instead of these sleaz, sleazy people. You could have been um, developing relationships with somebody, a, a, a woman that you could marry and have children with and have a, just have a real life. You could have been contributing to humanity in some real way. And you've spent your entire life on these trivial pursuits. And I couldn't help but feel like I would never want to trade a, my, a life full of meaningful pursuits for cheap thrills. I would never want to trade a life full of meaningful relationships for shallow relationships. I would never want to trade and give up a life of actual benefit to humanity for one of pure hedonism. And it was no longer the Iman that was holding me back, it was just simply, I think this is ugly and I kind of feel bad for you. Time goes by and I'm reading Quran and SubhanAllah, I come across an ayah that just sometimes you can go over an ayah many times and you think, SubhanAllah, it's beautiful and it's true. But sometimes after a particular experience, that ayah shines in a whole new light. And it just pops out at you. And this particular ayah was when Allah says, لا تقربوا الزنا إنه كان فاحشة وساء سبيلا. Allah says, don't approach zina. إنه كان فاحشة. It is and has always been and will always be an immorality. And also, this is the important part, Allah says, وساء سبيلا. Allah says it is evil as a path. And the word path just jumped out of the page. Why? Because you expect Allah is talking about zina, an action. So Allah is going to say it is evil as an action. It is evil as a deed. You're expecting that it's going to say sa'a amalan. It is evil as some sort of an action. And yet subhanAllah, Allah shifts the direction and says what? It is evil as a path, as a lifestyle. Why? Because Allah knows His creation. And Allah knows that the man is such that when he looks at a woman that is attractive, he can only focus in, zero in, become fixated, and have tunnel vision on the act. I just want to be with that woman. And so Allah is saying, no, look a little bit broader. Think about everything that has, you have to do that builds up towards it. Think about everything after it. Think about the lifestyle. And subhanAllah, when I thought back, when I thought back about my friend and how attractive it sounded when he said, I've been with X number of women, it sounded, that sounds amazing. But then immediately when he describes the path to it, and it slowly corrodes the image, and you realize that this is a horrible path, and then Allah says, don't look at the deed. Open up and, and broaden your vision and recognize that it is evil as a path. I said, SubhanAllah, this is Kalamullah. This is incredible. That Allah recognizes the, 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 the short-sightedness of man, how he get, develops this tunnel vision, and how he needs to open up his eyes, and realize that this involves an entire lifestyle. It is going to take up all your time and all your money. It is an evil path. Sa'a sabila, the path. 
Don't be mesmerized by the end goal. Think about the entirety of the path and you will recognize just how evil indeed it is. So the question then comes, how do we avoid this evil lifestyle? Perhaps the simplest and most obvious answer is, as the expression goes, an idle mind is the devil's playground. Keep busy in good things. When your mind is idle, then you get involved in a lot of haram. But when you keep busy, it keeps you away from evil. Allah tells us in the Quran, اُتْلُ مَا أُوحْيَ إِلَيْكَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةِ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا تَصْنَعُونَ Allah says what? That recite from that which has been revealed to you from the book. So get involved in Qur'an. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةِ And pray your salawat. So when you're reading Qur'an and falling in love and finding out what is Allah saying to me, what is Allah's words to me directly, this is a beautiful pursuit and it will keep you busy inshallah, keep you away from haram. When you get involved in your salawat, it will keep you away from haram. And then Allah says, yes, this will keep you away from fahsha'i uh, wal munkar, immorality and wicked deeds. And then on top of that, wala dhikrullahi akbar. And the remembrance, indeed, the remembrance of Allah is the greatest, is even greater. Why? Because it's not just the recitation of the Qur'an, but it's how the Qur'an makes you remember Allah. It's not just the salah, but it's how the salah brings Allah into mind, not just during salah, but outside of salah as well. It's the dhikr of Allah when it's present in your life constantly, that is going to be so, so much greater. Greater than what? Greater than any deed and greater than the temptation of the fahsha and the munkar. It's going to overpower it, inshallah ta'ala. And then Allah finishes by saying, Wallahu ya'lamu ma tasna'un. Allah knows what you do. But the word do here is not Wallahu ya'lamu ma taf'alun or, or, or ta'amalun. Allah specifically chose tas, tasna'un. Why? Because sana'a means to build or to manufacture something. So Allah is saying, I know not just, not just what you do, but I know the schematics. I know what you're building towards. So in the context of fahsha and munkar, oftentimes a guy will throw a glance. And someone will say, hey, what are, you, what are you doing looking over there? I'm just looking. He'll go and talk. I'm just talking. Right? And so he can trick the whole world and fool everybody. But Allah knows the schematics in his mind, the blueprint. In his mind, the look was, the look was for what? It was the first brick. And then the, 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 the question, the little conversation, that was the second brick. And each little action is another brick and he knows, he knows what he's building towards. He knows what the blueprint is, he knows what the final uh, you know, manufactured building, he knows what it looks like. He knows what each, each action is. So Allah is saying, Allah knows exactly what you're building towards. So don't think that you can fool Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead, have the dhikr of Allah in your mind. Because when you remember Allah, you remember that Allah is all-knowing even of your very private secret thoughts. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, أَلَا لَا يَخْلُوَنَّ رَجُلٌ بِمْرَأَةٍ إِلَّا كَانَ ثَالِثَهُمَا الشَّيْطَانِ Indeed, a man is not alone with a woman, but the third of them is shaytan. We know this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, and this is the final point, inshallah, with this, these three hadith I'd like to close. On several occasions, the Prophet ﷺ emphasized the importance of getting young people married. If we want to protect our youth, from this type of haram, then as the, as the saying goes, the, the, the more and more you make halal difficult, the more and more you make haram easy. I hope we know this expression. It's a common saying and it's so true. The more parents put restrictions and make it difficult for their children to get married in a halal way, the more and more they're making it easier for them to do things behind your back in a haram way. So we need to make halal easy. The Prophet ﷺ says, ثَلَاثٌ لَا تُؤَخِرْهَا Three things you should never delay. الصلاة إذا آنت Prayer when it's come in. Pray immediately, don't delay. Why? Because you're going to probably miss it. So don't, don't delay your salawat. We know the importance of praying your salawat on time and praying right when it comes in. والجنازة إذا حضرت The janaza when it is ready. In other words, do you leave a body rotting? نعوذ بالله Of course not. The person passes away, immediately you have to jump into action. In the same way, والأيم إذا وجدت لها كفأن and the marriage of a young woman when you found somebody compatible. This does not mean that you force. This does not mean that you peer pressure and say you need to get married even if they're not ready. No, this is saying when she's ready and when you found somebody compatible, what are you waiting for? Why are you saying, oh, you know what, we'll wait a couple of years, make sure that you finish the degree, and then the, you know, after the bachelor's, the master's, and then after that you have to get the job, and you have to make sure you have a couple hundred thousand in the bank to make sure that you're ready, then you can get married. SubhanAllah, what are you doing? This is, this is dhulm, this is wrong.
When you find somebody compatible, make the path to halal easy. The Prophet says, Ya ma'ashar al-shabab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'ah, falyatazawwaj. O young men, whoever of you can marry, whoever of you have the ability to marry, then get married, and if you can't, then you should fast. Let's focus on the first part. Most of the time people say, go fast, young man, go fast. But look at the first part. The first part is, if you can, do it. That means if you're financially capable or ready, you should engage. And if your parents can help you with that, then they should as well. There's nothing wrong with a father saying, listen, young man, I know you're young and you may have certain people that you're getting involved with. So before you fall into anything haram, look, simple. We can get the nikah done. She can still live at her house. You can live at our house. No problem. Continue pursuing your degree. And there's nothing wrong with that. She can come over here when she wants comfortably. You can go over there and there, everything's halal. And inshallah ta'ala, when you're ready, then you'll move out. But as long as everything's halal, that has the barakah. Some people say, no, but what if it ends in divorce? If they're dating, they could break up too. It could be heartbreaks the same way. What if she gets pregnant? If they're dating, she can get pregnant too. It's the same thing. The only difference is, it's halal versus haram. There's barakah versus no barakah. And also, it's with the uh, uh, consent of the families instead of doing things behind everybody's back, which makes things a lot worse. And the final hadith that I want to mention, ثَلَاثَةٌ حَقٌ عَلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَوْنُهُمْ that the Prophet, says, the Prophet ﷺ says, there are three who are promised the help of Allah. Imagine, three people, they're guaranteed the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the haqq, it's their right that they get the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Mukatab, Al-Mukatab alladhi yuridu al-ada. The slave who wants to write a contract so that he could work towards freedom. This is the beauty of Islam, that subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a system, and Allah mentions this in Surah Nur, in ayah number 33, that when the slave wants to be freed, he goes to the master and says, let's write a contract. How much must I work in order to, free, to get myself free? Islam is designed to work towards freedom and you're not allowed to deny them. You have to give them that, it's called a manumission, a manumission or whatever, however it's pronounced. You have to give them that road to uh, freedom, inshallah. And Allah is saying, I will help you on that path. This is, this is what the Prophet is, is saying. The second is, The person who gets married in order to protect himself from zina. Allah is saying, I guarantee, excuse me, the Prophet is saying, Allah is guaranteeing you help. That Allah is going to help you. Why? Because you know that you want, you're about to fall into zina. And so you say, oh Allah, maybe I'm you know, not the most ready, but oh Allah, help me to be ready and to handle this because I don't want to fall into zina. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you. And the third is Al Mujahid fi sabillah, the, the, the warrior fi sabillah. All of these three are faced with daunting tasks, very scary and daunting missions. This, the, the, the slave is, 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 is very intimidated. What is freedom like? The, the, the single person is wondering, oh my goodness, what is marriage like? And the mujahid is wondering, what is it going to be like when I face the army? And in those three cases, when people are facing a daunting task for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet is telling us what? That Allah is guaranteeing that He will help you in that path. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who make the halal easy and the haram, therefore making the haram more difficult. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who try to help our youth find halal means to uh, 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 approach the opposite gender. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who apply these ayat and these ahadith in our lives. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who keep us away from zina. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. Wa afina fi man afayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa barik lana fi ma a'atayt. Wa qina sharra ma qadayt. Fa innaka taqdi wa la yuqda alayk. Innahu la yadhillu man walayt. Wa la ya'izzu man aadayt. Tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayt. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Wa qina a'adha bin nar. Wa sallallahu ala sallam Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sallam. صحبي وسلم تسليم كثيرة وأقم الصلاة